<laughs> so, <laughs> so who are you? I, I'm S.J. Klein. Yeah. Who are you? S.J. Klein. I'm uh, Charvax. Nicole. Nicolas! <laughs> yes, Charvax. Great to meet you. And Christophe Derndorfer. Hey, good to meet you. How are you doing? So, uh, what is the status of uh, OOPC right now? You're asking me. You're asking me. <laughs> no, but you're the, you're asking me? You're the independent journalist, right? No, no, I'm not, an, I'm not a journalist. I'm a blogger. Um, blogger. And I'm also not uh, objective. I'm very subjective uh, and very opinionated. So, yeah, I'm not a journalist. I don't know. I mean, the, the status quo of all PC, it's definitely, it's interesting times, you know. Um, there are almost two million laptops out there, and, you know, apart from, you know, having given out the laptop, now the question is how is do we... Is it two million or three million? Almost three million. Three million, yeah? Not, we're not quite not there yet. yet. We're getting there. Okay. Sorry. No, no, no worries, no worries. Um, the point being that, you know, now that the laptop's out there, the next question becomes, you know, how do you actually use those laptops for education, for changing education, and for learning? Um, but it's still in many ways, we just had the discussion inside, you know, that you kind of um, snuck us out from, you know, what can all PC as an organization do to, to you know, advance those, those kinds of fields and uh, deal with those challenges and come up with solutions. Is that something that happens automatically? Basically, if you have a big deployment, does it automatically involve content and uh, learning, uh, education, organization and all that? The great thing about a, a really large project, a project that becomes part of the social fabric in a country, is that everyone has to think together about what it means. When you're doing a small project, you can cherry pick people who have ideas. And so each person is there to try and implement a personal idea of theirs. But when everyone is doing it together, it becomes a community event. I, I think the best discussion we had in the last session was someone saying, yes, in Jamaica, when and, you know, when we were introducing something to the community, there was a party and everyone left work and the police and the shop owners, everyone just came out to see what was happening and they all d developed this shared understanding that what they were doing was empowering their kids to solve and like, move away from problems that they had faced for a generation or two generations. But you agree, this is the best project in, in the history of mankind, right? Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the best project in the history of humankind. It's definitely the best project that I've personally been able to participate in. And, you know, um, you know it's just a, a great community and I'm having a lot of fun. I'm learning a lot of things and I'm meeting a lot of interesting and great people, you know, who you can collaborate with, you know, who you can, you know, go to lunch with, who you can share a beer with in the evening. So, yeah, for me personally, it's definitely one of the coolest projects I've ever been involved in. Since 2007, you write on the yeah. blog? Yeah, exactly. So, what was your vision in the beginning? Did you, did you see this as a billion laptops next year, or you thought critical in some way how it can be deployed so big? How how does, it, how does it work to get big numbers? It's just a question of money, no? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't think that it was going to be a billion laptops or even 10 million laptops within one or two years because, I, you know, I, when I was young, I lived in Peru, so I have a bit of an understanding, a tiny bit of an understanding of what, you know, uh, developing nations are like, you know, what education in those places is like. But for me, and, and what still drives me, and I think what drives most of us here, and what, what drives SJ is, you know, the, the, the question of, of how can we really improve the world in some way with education, and then as a sub-question of that, how can we use technology, which happens to be a laptop at the moment, might be a tablet tomorrow, might be something entirely different a couple of years down the road, how can we use that to really change and improve education, so the children of today, which are tomorrow's future, uh, or tomorrow's now really, <laughs> today's <Tomorrow's> future, <laughs> um, how they can really have a have a better life and we can have a better world. Kind of sounds hippie like, but that, you know, that that is sounds pretty hippie. <laughs> but, but, you, <laughs> but you agree that that it's kind of proven now, with all the pilots that have been uh, made already, it's proven that it works, that it makes that is positive. What do you mean it works? Define it works. That it's the it's worth the money, for example, or that it's worth the effort, it's worth the enthusiasm. Is that a proof? Or what do you say? I mean, I, I can only comment on my own enthusiasm and my own money, and yeah, that's been well spent on the project, and I'm having a good time. Um, whether, whether, it's, whether it's worth or whether it works, I think very much depends on the local context. So I think, for example, in, in Uruguay, despite some challenges and issues they're encountering, overall I think it works beautifully, and we're going to see a lot of positive impacts, maybe 10, 15, 25 years down the road. In other countries, for example, Peru, uh, the, the pro project is running into a lot of issues, and whether it's money well worth spent there, I'm not so sure about. But then again, you know, it's not my money. <laughs> so, so how, how how's the difference between Uruguay and Peru? What's, why is the difference? 
pretty much all of the rural problems that that uh, that you have in in some much smaller, or much or much less developed countries. They have people out in rural places that are a week away off of the internet, and uh, they have to deal with all the all the trade-offs between really large urban schools and these really remote uh, rural schools with teachers who themselves need uh, need training and facilitation and and uh, better ways. I mean, the teachers need need inspiration to become part of this of this new uh, of that of that social change as well. And in Uruguay, they already had this this well-developed plan to provide connectivity. So I think Peru just is going to take another few years to reach that level of uh, having all the parts fit together to to make the society as a whole transform from one where people were lucky if they had access to information and collaboration to one where that's part of everyday life for uh, for all their children, for all their Peru families. Peru is a huge country, right? Peru is, is really large. No, I mean, and what, what, what? No, continue. No, the only thing I want to intersect is I totally agree with SJ that Peru in many ways it's just much, much harder to do a project like that. Not just because of the scale and geography and many different languages and all those things, but also because of the pre-existing level of infrastructure, of knowledge and things like that. So it's definitely, I mean, one laptop per child in Peru is a much, much harder project than all PC in Europe, right? no doubt about that. Yet I do believe and I've often written about that on, on my blog and other places that also the project implementation wasn't uh, very well thought out and ran into some issues. And you know, even though it, it was harder, or it is harder to get something started there with a pro better project implementation in Peru, I think a lot of those challenges could have been overcome earlier or we wouldn't have been running into some of those issues that we're seeing today. That's my personal point of view. I, I see Peru working very well to overcome their problems as they, as they encounter them, but I mean, it's, I, I see it as the microcosm of the, of the problem for the world. There are, parts, there are places in Peru where things work beautifully and there are places where they're very difficult. And it's sort of, it's, I, I actually think that we're really lucky that Peru is the, is the country where we've had the biggest saturation, I mean, we've had the biggest deployment, and where we have this combination of easy and hard, because they happen to have this very constructionist view of learning. And so that was one whole set of discussions we never had to have. Peru has often been leading in ideas about how to, how to be constructionists in the classroom. They're doing this awesome work <laughs> with Lego and with, and with technology that's, that complements the work done with OPC. So uh, I, I, it's certainly true that, that there are problems to be overcome there, but I actually feel that once that's done, and I'm confident that, that we'll get there, that will be a model. Like Uruguay does not provide a model for most of the world. Uruguay is this ideal that some that organizations, uh, countries with enough infrastructure can aspire to. Peru will actually provide a model, a very diverse model of how people that people can draw from in different. In so different w w when you do the marketing uh, for OLPC, you, you can you have uh, studies that show the success rate, right? You have you can you have lots of pilots now. Yes, and, and so there's, a, there's been a bunch of research that's done. I think a lot of the research, people who try to do traditional baseline and, uh, and comparative research like to have a few years for which th th that they can compare. So I think we're just getting to that point this year in the reports that are being issued. Uh, Uruguay is doing this $2 million study in collaboration with, uh, with the NSF, and uh, that should be done in, in another year. A number of a number of the larger larger deployments are doing their own studies. The studies we have to date often say, here are some tentative, you know, here's some interim uh, observations we've made, and they tend to be positive, but the kinds of um, the, the kinds of more uh, like uh, numerical and statistically significant analyses done over a long period of time by a big uh, by a big an analysis uh, uh, by a sociology group, yeah. and not just by the deployment team, because deployment teams naturally have to produce reports. Um, that hasn't. I, I, I would say that we're, we have another year before the first good ones come out, and maybe another two or three years before you can have a spectrum across the different kinds of deployments. Because if you have results that say this is 100% success, then there's no reason there shouldn't be a billion of these out, right? And let's say that uh, some countries That's have hard. problems with uh, with uh, let's say some countries have problems with internet connectivity mm -hmm. uh, and power. Is, do you see it as something that's surmountable and actually but, uh, there's, it doesn't have to cost too much in terms of extra price on top of just the laptop? Well, I mean, if you, if you look at, at uh, current studies of what's going on in, in not just OPC projects, but similar projects in other parts of the world, it turns out that the cost of the device, in this case the EXO laptops, is only maybe 15 to a maximum of 20% of the total cost of ownership of such a project. Because you need to look at things like you mentioned, like infrastructure in terms of connectivity, in terms of electricity. You need to look at teacher training, you need to look at, at maintenance and support, you need to look at things like developing content and curriculum and, and materials, building up digital libraries and all those things. So uh, 
those that, that's already part of, of the total cost equation. Yeah? But again, it's not just about throwing money at the, at the wall and, and seeing what sticks. I mean, as you see with the old PC XO development in itself, you know, how the laptop was created and, and you know, the whole generations and generations of netbooks that came out of this whole effort. You know, it's not just about doing something you know, the same way over and over again with more money, but coming up with new and innovative uh, ways, for example, to, to deal with connectivity. And some of the people who presented here yesterday showed some nice effort. So I think those challenges, as also as Jay mentioned before, are surmountable and you can deal with them. But yeah, it is definitely a very, very hard thing to do. What are you doing to have the content work offline, kind of, to, to, to build in the Wikipedia on the laptops? Are you doing some we've, new things there? We've had some great discussions here about how the, the new school servers are going to, uh, like school server builds that different people are using in their own countries, provide for full offline caches of Wikipedia to complement the offline activity, which has you know, a selection in, in different languages. Uh, there's a new tool chain that lets people pick their language and they can produce their own snapshot of Wikipedia, which is great for, the, for some of the deployments that are in smaller countries that haven't had uh, an outside group already do that for them. And, and then people have started to, uh, to create their own local customizations in some of the countries or in some of the regions where they have a few thousand students. The teachers have worked with the students to make small customizations and we're working to push those changes back uh, to projects like Wikipedia that are, that are online so that everyone can see that there is this group. It's not totally offline, it's a little offline and it, has this in, it can have this meaningful interaction with the rest of the mm -hmm. content producing world every few months. So when a country or a region asks you about what it might cost to implement OLPC, you have already a whole bunch of numbers where you can say if you do solar, if you do uh, teacher training, if you do all these things, you can kind of put it on a budget and there are ways to, it doesn't have to be too expensive, like 10-15% 10, 10, sounds low as the price of the laptop. It, it does sound low. So I mean, I think the, the best number that we had is from Uruguay where they said that their total cost of ownership over four years was under $300, including the cost of the laptop. Uh, now that, that's sort of an, a best case scenario where you already have <laughs> lots of infrastructure that you're building on. I think that in places with no infrastructure where you have to build out all of your Wi-Fi network and, and if you're planning to implement all of the five principles, you're planning saturation and connectivity, yeah. um, uh, I, I think there are some places where you might get 15%, but I think that that's one of the, that's one of the cost uh, questions that changes dramatically when you shift from doing it in one region or in one school district to doing a country. When you do a country, there's no way it's going to only be 10% of the whole. If you just do one region, all the infrastructure, you have to figure out, the, you have to figure out uh, introduction to teachers and family, the repair centers, all the little pieces which will end up scaling very well, you're doing for the first time. And, and this is the one point where I think we don't have the best cross-sectional data across projects. We sort of have Rwanda and Peru and Uruguay that have a, a, a nice baseline, but all the other regions are small enough that they haven't overcome, uh, they're, they're still working to figure out what that cost would look like when everything's gets. I mean, can I add to that? And I, and I think what, what's changing or what, what I hope will change is that the, the cost of other things like teacher training, like maintenance should go down over time as more and more experiences are being made. So people don't have to you know, reinvent the, uh, the, the, the wheel. And because you know, Uruguay or Peru or Nicaragua or, or um, you know, Mozambique, uh, Madagascar can present models how things should be done and other people can build upon that knowledge which has been created over the past few years and make those other things uh, less expensive in many ways. But building, for example, power infrastructure is something that they should have anyways, right? Yes. I mean, one of the reasons to do this kind of project at scale is it brings the entire country forward. Yes, you're doing it for the short term because you want to improve primary education, but you end up with a platform that supports knowledge sharing, that supports yeah. entrepreneurship. Uh, when internet. Those, that, that, that supports general internet access. Yeah. Right. The teachers suddenly have email. They're able to communicate better with other people in, in, their, uh, in their education network. So uh, this is... The, this is when you ask your question, you're like, aren't there easy numbers? The, the one reason that the numbers aren't so easy is <laughs> as soon as you move beyond the hardware that is owned by the kids, everything else is part of community infrastructure that you want for, for many reasons.